Welcome to this inaugural edition of uh, our joint collaborative effort on uh, uh, creating a conversation around uh, one of the most important issues, insurgent ideologies, and how they are challenging nations and societies and communities um, across the world. Uh, some of us have been discussing this in India for uh, close to three or four years um, in, a, in a sustained manner, but I don't think we have had an um, institutionalized uh, arrangement which can bring in talent and, and thinkers from around the world uh, and bring in uh, ideas and research from uh, various institutions that are engaging with this on a, on a, on a regular basis. And we at ORF uh, decided to do this. We are delighted that we have uh, Ambassador Christian Doucet, who is uh, the director of the Geneva Center, who decided to partner with us. And thank you, uh, Ambassador, for your support and for your partnership and leadership in shaping this particular conversation. And of course, the Swiss Embassy in Delhi, um, uh, uh, represented by Mrs. Tamara Mona this evening, uh, also became a very willing and enthusiastic collaborator in this particular effort. Uh, we want to make this an annual uh, conversation. Uh, it's not a one-off for us, and I think this is going to be the fourth big platform we put together at the Observer Research Foundation, and uh, we are going to be encouraging and inviting contributions around research and, and of course, uh, the thought pieces that we will carry on this particular microsite we have created. So this is something that we will be following up on, and we encourage all of you to share your ideas and thoughts on how to shape this program in the days ahead. So all of you who have come here should join us again next year around the same time for the uh, second edition of this particular conversation. Now, I don't want to take any more time other than the fact that I want to congratulate at the very beginning, at the outset, my colleague Maya Meer Chandani, who has uh, single-handedly created this fantastic uh, forum and, and program. And I know we are supposed to do this at the end of the conference, but many of you may not be there, so I want to do it at the very beginning. Um, and uh, thank you, Maya, for, for shaping this, and Sushant and your team, uh, Sonakshi and, uh, and Swati, uh, for putting this all together. Uh, with that, let me first invite the chairman of the Observer Research Foundation, Mr. Sanjay Joshi, uh, to deliver the opening remarks. Mr. Joshi, please. Mm. Thank you, Samir, uh, for that opener. It's a delight being here. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Duse, thank you so much for this partnership. Uh, Tamara Mona, glad you're here. Distinguished experts who arrived uh, from various parts of the world, from what I can see, excellencies, experts, and of course, our young students who are going to be here making presentations uh, day after. All of you welcome uh, for this uh, conference on tackling insurgent ideologies. Uh, we live in dangerous times. That has become a platitude, uh, so as to say. And uh, on the one hand, you know, social media has kind of removed all the barriers uh, for dissemination of information, news, and views. And it's created this kind of uh, you know, information explosion uh, by placing in our hands the ability to create multiple clones of ourselves. So it has also started spawning a whole lot of uh, falsehoods, uh, degenerating into not so civil comments at times, uh, which then turn into hate speech, which then turn into uh, radicalization online. So these are all issues that we had been discussing and talking about uh, for many years. And then ORF decided in partnership with Facebook uh, to jump into the fray and take up a program on how we could, and actually a practical program, on how to tackle insurgent ideologies, counter-violent extremism uh, on the social media, online, and wherever it occurs. What are the techniques? What are the ways this could be done? And today, yes, you know, smartphones have uh, become the networking platforms which have placed this incredible power in all our hands. Uh, they are allowing us not just to create one but two identities, one on Facebook, one on LinkedIn, and not just two. Sometimes it is multiple identities and multiple digital identities, which becomes our avatars, which go out into the uh, digital world out there. Uh, and as uh, the, you know, the Joker observed in uh, The Dark Knight, give a man a mask, he'll become his true self. So this is what starts happening. The online world today hosts all manners of esoteric clubs, 
uh, and cults that breathe life into uh, some of the weirdest and wildest conspiracy theories, which go viral immediately on the internet. And so it happens that globalization and the advance of communication technologies have shown the potential to accentuate rather than to attenuate uh, tribalism, uh, because the very fact of diversity also highlights the differences which exist between us. So maintaining sanity in discourse, maintaining sanity through public discourse, is today posing one of the biggest challenges uh, in the kind of open, ungoverned space that is a social media. And the flip side of this is uh, that the demand for regulation often veers dangerously close to calls for censorship and controls. And that is definitely something we must avoid. So let us not forget that in spite of all the avatars we may embrace, uh, the power that technology places in our hands, the techniques which are used to frame other people and groups uh, in ways that justify the exclusion, exile, or excite violence against them, those techniques are as old as humankind. Those haven't changed. No, they consist of labeling, drawing comparisons with known hate figures, or sometimes using euphemisms. Then you go on to attributing and apportioning blame, show how you've been victimized, and over time, dehumanize the target, morally exclude the target, and make him the subject of violence. And at the surface, countering hate speech is about tackling each of these singly as and when they occur. Now, there is the example, of course, of uh, Moonshot CV. Uh, which used uh, now somehow uh, controversial micro-targeting strategies to you know, redirect potential candidates who would be searching, uh, you know, doing search words on, say, how to do on a jihadi group, to redirect them to sites which started giving them counter messages, maybe even counseling, directing them to sites which gave them uh, some other kind of uh, you know, psychological uh, bulwark which could wean them again from this kind of thing. So there are various platforms on social media we started hitting back, rolling back in various ways. But let us not forget that social media itself is still in its adolescence, but barely in its teenagers. Come to think of it, all began with uh, sites like Friendster in 2002. LinkedIn, MySpace came the following year. Facebook, of course, opened to the general public only in 2006, which is just about 12 years ago. And many of these today survive, you know, Friendster survives as an online gaming site. Very few know of it today. But the fact is that countering violent extremism, that is CV, using social media through counter narrative itself, is an extremely young discipline. And we are still in the process of learning. Uh, and if we are to continue doing so, then we, this must be an iterative process where we constantly reformulate the strategies we have in hand. Therefore, the need to keep on inquiring how there can be more effective modes of pushback using social media technologies. Uh, there is a lot of discussion which is going to take place over the next two days on this. The first few learnings, of course, have been fairly obvious. Uh, no, it is not you know, simple messaging like Islamist narrative must be countered as a counter extremist priority. I mean, those, those, those kinds of messaging don't work. Counter narrative is least effective uh, if it becomes a euphemism uh, for propaganda by governments and states. It has to completely stay away from something like that. Second, as we develop strategies for developing uh, counter narratives, it is instructive to you know, bear in mind Walter Fisher's dictum proposing that you know, narratives, what is a narrative? Narratives are not just the bread and butter of the film industry. Narratives are patterns constructed by human beings in order to understand a world they cannot really make sense of, which confuses them. That is what a narrative is. And for that reason, religion always has been one of the richest storehouses of storytelling. The richest sources of narratives, the richest stories come out of religion. So counter-narrative cannot be limited to counter-messaging. Counter-messaging simply assumes that terrorist texts or videos are limited in the reach as pure communication or propaganda tools. And as studies show, 
It is impossible to understand jihadism, its objectives, its appeal for new recruits, and its durability without understanding the culture it spawns. That is extremely important part of the jihadist narrative. Therefore, for active, effective counter strategies, it is not just in the lies and the untruth, and we many times just tend to focus on those. So it is not in the just the lies and the untruth where we focus exclusively, but rather the coherence and the fidelity to events in the larger world which they create, that needs to be the target. Because these are what lend extremist narratives their power, the power to draw people in, to include them. Because for any narrative to work as a plausible and coherent narrative, to be the one that attracts people, draws them in, it must tell a story that makes sense of the world to its adherents. And that is the strategy they use. Because this is how it sucks them in. No, and it is the cultural resources available to a violent movement that sustain and direct that movement far more than material resources, such as finance or weaponry. So over the next two days, we are discussing the efficacy of various approaches to tackling insurgent ideologies and examining the approaches of different states and the policies they may have adapted, adopted to tackle violent extremism. As far as ORF is concerned, let me make a confession. Uh, if the field is young, we are even younger. We decided to enter into this field one year ago. India has so far prided itself to be a bulwark against the spread of radical ideologies. Uh, but however, we believed and still believe that it is not something that we can take for granted. And a study by ORF scholars of comments posted on public uh, Facebook pages between 2016 and 2017 indicated clear signs of indicated polar, you know, accentuating polarization. So we roped in organizations like Youth Care Watch. We began our own exploration in this space. And our voice positive challenge sought to involve youth in a program uh, that worked with teams of students from across 60 colleges across the country. We did not restrict ourselves to the metropolises, but went down to tier two, tier three cities, involved the students there. And the challenge before them was to be creative and develop and execute counter campaigns on social media that were credible, that were effective enough to resonate between, you know, within the communities. So our workshop threw up some interesting learnings. Depolarizing the social discourse is about creating, as I said, a counterculture that does not merely obliterate, but assimilates. It assimilates the differences that extreme ideologies try to create. The narratives we seek to seed must be part of the counterculture and themselves pass the test of coherence and fidelity. So it is all about not just the message or the medium, but it's in a way of creatively fusing form and content, and above all, the communal culture, community cultures in a method which is completely sincere. And that is the most important part of it. So our studies, as well as our interactions, revealed how hate speech was provoked by specific incidents. So news flow has a very important impact Therefore, the need for people who are soldiering in this field to keep an eye constantly on the news. Well, 10 of the teams which did this are here. They will be presenting some of the campaign strategies to this audience uh, of academics, practitioners. We have law enforcing officials in our midst. And the paradox of our times is that uh, you know, the, it is established through studies that the, most, uh, uh, the, the, the highest risk of indoctrination is in the age group eight to 18. And the paradox is that this is precisely the age group that can most easily be channelized into creative community and social activities. And it can become a bulwark against as effective community networks for any CV program. So our hope is that some of the learnings as we go along down this route uh, uh, become move beyond being student projects and in the process become a learning for us and others in sustainable strategies in countering violent extremism. That is all I have to say. We'll have a lot of these discussions as we go on in the next two days. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me now invite uh, Ambassador Christian Doucet, who's the director of the uh, Geneva Center for Security Policy, 
Uh, Ambassador, please. Honorable uh, Minister of State for External Affairs, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege and honor to be here uh, tonight and uh, be here with uh, my friend Samir, we met a year ago, and then we proceed in uh, being able to co-sponsor this conference. Um, today we stand at a particular day because uh, tomorrow we might have a very important summit. And for us at GCSP, at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, it's a very symbolic moment because we were created by the Swiss government just after another impossible summit. It was in November 1985, it was in Geneva, and it was the very first summit between President Reagan and Chairman Gorbachev and paved the way for a new endeavor in disarmament and affected all of us. So, as we are opening this conference, as observing recent development in the world, one might think that countering and preventing violent extremism is a quickly disappearing idea. However, the concept is still going strong. The world has decided to march on in its effort to focus on prevention, as well as identify and address the root causes and symptoms of violent extremism. This is also largely inspired by the 2016 PVE action plan of former Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, who challenged the world, and especially its leaders, international organizations, and NGOs, to take a lead effort on PVE. This is especially evident in Geneva, where the GCSP has been proactive and strategic in taking the league in CVE and PVE in three domains, dialogue, education, and research. Already in December 2015, in cooperation with the permanent mission of Morocco and the United States of America, we hosted the first international policy dialogue on PVE. In 2016, we took the lead in advising and supporting the first meeting of the group of friends of PVE. The group, 40 nations strong, met formally for the first time in September 2016 in Geneva. We are also engaged in building capacity and creating global networks for members of civil societies and NGO. In April of last year, we partnered with the Global Solution Exchange to host 37 non-governmental institutions in Geneva, and we are on the steering committee to help support groundbreaking research on PVE along with the United States Institute for Peace. We've also jointly created, along with the Federal Departments of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, an online platform from the prevention of violent extremism in order to create a virtual community and to engage collaboration for all international stakeholders working on PVE. A week from now, we will host a workshop that will focus on two uh, concepts, political Islam and far-right extremism. These two undesirable components energize each other. For this reason, analyzing similarities, differences, and shared propaganda strategies between the two ideologies is increasingly crucial for European efforts against all forms of radicalizations. As regards to education, the second part of our work, we were the first to design an international course entitled Designing a National Strategy on PVE, a course designed for policymakers and international officials to create comprehensive and inclusive strategies on PE for national, regional, and institutional framework. Since then, we have conducted multiple PV courses, some in cooperation with international partners, for example, HEDAYA and the Global Center for Cooperative Security, or designed specific countries, such as Afghanistan or Thailand. 
as was mentioned before, narratives and content narratives is very important. So we have decided to create a new, a groundbreaking initiative that use the combination of media in all its form, traditional and social medias, and all the form of arts, from live arts, street art, music, dance, film, and theater. And it's the prospect on supporting tolerance, humanity, and preventing conflict. We have given the task to a Syrian refugee, and since then, the, this uh, Syrian has been creating a very new course and one of the popular courses, most, most popular courses at Georgetown University in Washington. And her tagline and the motto of the course is just simple. And in line what you said before, Mr. Chairman, let's make peace more captivating than conflict. And none of less people weaponize all form of arts in the media. PV needs a comprehensive, global, and innovative approach. It is our responsibility to create new ideas, foster creativity, and build integrity. Our philosophy at GCSP is simple. It is don't fight the problem, shape the solution. We will continue to be very active in promoting the momentum on PV and CV, and we are very much worth uh, very much looking forward to exploring with you new avenues and to collaborate with you and the global community in preventing violent extremism. We and my colleagues from Geneva, we are thrilled to be here tonight to share our expertise and help support this timely event. I would like also to thank ORF, to thank the Swiss Embassy in India and also the British High Commission for their work in co-sponsoring this event. I wish everyone a fruitful event and all good discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me invite Mrs. Tamara Mona, the Shade of the Swiss Embassy to India and Bhutan. Uh, the embassy in Delhi is commemorating the 70 years of Swiss-Indian friendship and they are supporting this uh, event and this particular project under that ambit. Uh, Ms. Tamara Mona, may I invite you please. Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. It is a special pleasure for me to address words of welcome to you, an audience determined to engage for the three coming days with no less than the goal to improve security in the world. I warmly thank the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the Observer Research Foundation, which have played a leading role in bringing us all together today. We are coming together during a very special year for Switzerland. It was mentioned uh, before, for Switzerland and India. We are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the signing of the Swiss Indian Treaty of Friendship. Since then, our relations have transformed into a full-fledged partnership. Over the last 18 months, there have been no less than three meetings at the highest level between the two countries including the state visit to India by President Leuthard in late August 2017 and the working meeting in Davos in January this year between Prime Minister Modi and the Swiss President Berset. These substantive contacts are strong indicators of our intensifying and rich relationship. Trade and economics are at the center or at the heart of our relationship. India is Switzerland's fourth largest trading partner in Asia and its first in South Asia. Switzerland is the 11th largest investor in India, and the, and the more than 250 Swiss companies present in India have created 100,000 jobs. Negotiations are ongoing between the EFTA member states and India on the conclusion of a free trade agreement. Switzerland and India also strive to conclude a new investment protection agreement. Switzerland is also supporting India in its fight against corruption. On January 1st of this year, the bilateral agreement on the automatic exchange of information in tax matters entered into force. The official Swiss network in India, comprising of various agencies and working on a broad range of topics, from science and research, VET, climate change, to tourism and business promotion, is celebrating this partnership with a series of public events. 
Today's conference is part of these exchanges. I take this opportunity to thank our valued sponsors who have made these, cele these celebrations possible. With our initiative called Connecting Minds, Inspiring the Future, we aim to further strengthen our bilateral relations by showcasing the innovative, future-oriented elements of both countries, literally bringing together minds. The initiative aims at encouraging what we do here today, connecting Swiss and Indian personalities, innovating in all fields, bringing together researchers, practitioners from the two countries and from many more, involved in, involved in the process of developing strategies that deal with the proliferation of radicalism and violence through state and civil society approaches. In Delhi today, we are striving to make progress in preventing violent extremism in all countries, in fragile contexts as well as in all others. As states, it is our responsibility to protect our citizens and defend their rights and freedoms. Preventing violent extremism also means stepping up efforts to promote the rule of law, human rights, and in armed conflicts, international humanitarian law. In our battle against terrorism, we must make use of preventive as well as repressive measures. In short, taking action at the roots of terrorism and emphasizing values. This policy approach which puts prevention at the heart of our action is the policy approach to which my country wants to intensively contribute to. Preventing radicalization is first and foremost a national challenge. At the national level, Switzerland is not only actively fighting racism and racial discrimination, but is also educating people about human rights. The counterterrorism strategy of the Swiss government focuses on four spheres of action, prevention, law enforcement, protection, and crisis management. The strategy aims to prevent radicalization through education and employment and measures aimed at conditions in prisons, youth centers, and places of worship through dialogue with particularly vulnerable communities and by preventing the stigmatization of minorities as well. Our domestic experience guides our foreign policy commitments. Countering terrorism by preventing violent extremism is a priority of our foreign policy, and we are convinced, firstly, that human security for all is an integral part of national security, and secondly, that preventing violent extremism is the most effective way to counter terrorism. In concrete terms, we have developed a foreign policy action plan for preventing radicalization and violent forms of extremism. Its priorities, young people and women, one of its key instruments, International Geneva. Children and young adults do play very different roles in the context of violent extremism. They can form links with terrorist groups and go as far as committing terrorist acts themselves. They are also victims of terrorism. Most importantly, they can play a decisive role in mobilizing people against violent extremism. We therefore need not only to protect young people against violent forms of extremism and prevent them from being recruited by terrorist groups, but also to empower them to become active players in the fight against such extremism. The same applies to women. For example, Switzerland has launched an international initiative calling for the development of standards and best practices for juvenile justice in a counter-terrorism context. And we are working on the ground to give young people the chance to attend school, get a job, and earn their living. In short, to give them alternatives to violence. Over the last year, Switzerland has given more than 300,000 people, mostly young people, the opportunity to do vocational education and training in 20 countries. We intend to intensify these activities together with the private sector, which plays a primordial role in promoting skill acquisition and creating jobs. Switzerland can make a real contribution to these efforts thanks to international Geneva. Swiss-founded organizations like the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the Geneva Center for the Democratic Control of Armed Forces have already developed expertise and earned recognition internationally in areas related to the prevention of violent extremism. Let us not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that investing in the prevention of violent extremism costs far less than mitigating its consequences. The tackling insurgent ideologies dialogue will give a platform to an exchange of ideas, thus helping stakeholders to find out more what will, can, what will and can succeed. 
we look forward to a really interesting program with speakers of high merit and a meaningful agenda. Thank you so much.